say up. OK, so welcome to the class. You can just come in in the front. Uh, we're going to get started because I want to be judicious of time. There's a lot of stuff that we have planned for today, and I want to have some time for project discussions. So we'll just cover and do a quick demo of the planktoscope. I'm assuming you all saw some of the threads behind it with Ethan and uh, Adam's talk, but I'm just going to run it as a demo because it's really fun when it works. And I heard last time it didn't work, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so the unit is plugged in. Uh, it takes 12 volts, uh, cell phone chargers, stuff like that are pretty straightforward to run this with. That's what makes it portable. Uh, it's packed in these, these are called Pelican cases. Uh, they are phenomenal for doing field projects uh, because we just tested it. Uh, the unit mounted inside with a couple of holes and sealed. We can now make this entire thing completely waterproof. So I can take this thing, have the battery, close it, and then this can be sitting in a rain tank. It's raining, whatever might be happening. We can, you guys can just come up front. We're just gonna be hanging around here and on those benches. And you can leave bags behind if you want. Uh, so the comment that I was just making was for lots of projects, this is quite a good platform to build around if you're worried about field stuff and you're trying to put things outside. Uh, uh, there's a couple of tricks you have to do of how to get the parts uh, to seal well. Uh, as you can all see, uh, this is made out of bamboo flooring. Uh, bamboo flooring has become as, it's a waste product of bamboo processing, uh, but it's really, really robust because people walk on it. And so the lifetime of flooring is very important. And because one of the target applications and folks that we're building and designing this for is sailors, they really care about sustainability in many ways. And so it's just, it's kind of this notion of using a material uh, as much as we can to avoid plastic is what we were going for. It's a design choice. You know, it doesn't come, I mean, it has electronics, it has lots of parts that won't just degrade out there. Uh, but on the other hand, it's almost a gesture. And that's been actually very interesting. It does evoke, because we are trying to get community members to engage. Uh, the look and feel of it uh, just triggers a reaction in people that's positive, which is fun to think about. So, you know, like the bags we were talking about, what does it make a patient feel is actually quite important, even if you got all the functionality right. It's like, um, and so again, you know, you have to keep that in mind. Aesthetics is an important aspect of uh, building and designing products. Uh, there's another really fun component. There are magnets. So it just makes assembly really easy. So I'm just going to mount the imaging chip in here. The camera is down here that clips in. And so just then people are not making sets of mistakes. And my imaging chips I hide right behind this secret pocket. Uh, these imaging chips are... And then I'm assuming you guys are ready, right? Whenever. Do you want to assemble one? Or I guess you have, you'll just assemble it with them. OK. Uh, and I'm assuming you'll do a little uh, background. Uh, and I'll pick up the more theory side of it and kind of the device operations in the next lecture. So you can focus more on the uh, making and making people feel and understand the sets of components and parts and just a brief description. But then in the next lecture, uh, we can really do a, because we have a hard stop at 11 or something today, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you can already identify these are paper straws. Uh, so one use. Uh, this is the imaging chip. Uh, usually, the kinds of chips that are available in the biomedical industry. So you can see this is a very valuable component. Uh, this is a couple of cents in parts. It's a glass capillary that's flattened. Traditionally in biology and other places where people sell these types of imaging chips, they can cost $30, $35. They're all injection molded and just they are use and throw. Now there's no plastic in this, it's actually all glass, so optically it's the best resolution. And we just use heat shrink, kind of what you do in electronics with a hair dryer to cause that seal. 
And so suddenly now we have a tube and a seal. So that gives us the imaging chip. Uh, and it's useful because, you know, when we're starting to deploy, these things break and it's okay. You know, you shouldn't feel like, oh, suddenly now uh, uh, you're out of the imaging platform itself. So I'm going to now mount this in, in the system. There's a couple other components. Let's see if my coffee. Uh, did folks online get to see the chip? Do you all understand what you're looking at? Can you all see that, right? Two heat shrinks, Tigon tubing, and a glass capillary. Uh, it would be really fun if one of you wants to do this as a homework assignment of how to take round glass capillaries are very easy to find. Uh, cross. This is not a round capillary. It's a cross section is a rectangle. Uh, if any of you like playing with glass blowing, see if you can make a square capillary at home. How do you take a round capillary and squeeze it to make? Because if you could do that, then these capillaries would be available everywhere. We get them from this company that does glass blowing for all cross sections. They're still pretty cheap, but it's bottlenecked. Uh, so. Everybody has pulled capillaries before here, right? Yes? No? You've never taken a glass capillary, just light a candle and pull it? No? Okay, that's something we can just do. Do we have a lighter or something here? Or a candle? We have a lighter in the lab, right? Huh? Yeah, why don't you bring a Bunsen burner? But we would need a gas line, though, then. Yeah, match is tricky. I think it, or a candle would do the trick. Yeah. Anyway, people should play with it. And anybody who's playing with fire online, you know, please be responsible. Okay. It's, uh, I don't want to hear uh, accidents are, are fairly common with fire. Okay. So uh, there's a little filter in here. There's a couple other sets of components. This is the waste basket. So I'll mount that here. Uh, and then one key component are, uh, these are called lure locks uh, in a lot of medical contexts. These are very important. Anybody who's doing anything with water and fluids, this is a very important component when you're trying to make. Uh, so right there, they come in many different forms, but what's important is that they are standardized. So if this is a syringe, uh, I can get the male and the female lower locks to just couple in. So I'll take out some of those parts per se. So right here, for example. So uh, male, female, that clips in. And so then you can use a lot of medical supplies, for example. So, so that's a lower lock. Uh, and it's a really valuable component to have. In your regular general supply in your workshop, you should have these types of things. These are Tigon tubing. They're all biocompatible. So it's just whenever you're thinking about, oh, I'm gonna do anything medical prototypes, any food grade stuff, it's actually very useful to have. This is Tigon. There is very broad range of flexible tubings available. So just in your supply, you should create a little bag that just says, oh, I have these types of, and we have a ton of that just hidden around here itself as well. But it's a very good prototyping component. Uh, so I'm just gonna mount this, and one of the threads here is that you can see uh, in the two little pieces, there is a little chamfer that's cut out for the glass capillary so it doesn't crack. You guys can come up here if you want, just closer, just so if you can see. Hey, Adam. Uh, so I don't know if you guys can see uh, right there, there's a little kind of a slot cut out. That slot essentially mounts the, the chip per se, and it just sits in here. Uh, one of the other kind of a fun thing, which is again, trial and error, is you'll actually see that there is a little bit of this O-ring. Uh, why would we put an O-ring here? It's not trying to seal anything. This path is already sealed, so can you guess why, why might there be an O-ring? I said it was a trial and error, that's the hint. 
So I don't know if you guys can see. You see that little O-ring there? Why might you want to put... Remember, you're dealing with glass. Uh, and just so that the glass goes inside here. So... Um, no. Yeah, to crack the glass. It provides a cushion. And so you have this plate that's about to go in here. And I have two hard surfaces that will press on it. And that's not good. So I have a soft surface that's interfacing with the glass, which is, I mean, it's useful. It's fun. We switched from these $30, $40 IBD slides, which are pretty robust, to this delicate piece. Then you have to kind of think about it like, oh, what could I actually do uh, to make sure that uh, it doesn't lead to uh, uh, issue that's associated with the, uh, and again, you know, it's, it's something that you just pick up and learn by trying and error. So it's just, we broke a ton of these before in the past. And, you know, they do break from time to time. It's not a, uh, actually, Adam, what might be fun is, do you want to bring a small culture sample also, just because, I have some of the samples that I'm going to filter out, but I don't know what's in it. And just, it might be fun for people to see a little bioluminescence, actually. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's, yeah, I think that might be a fun. And one thing that I'm just doing is I'm kind of going through this slowly in terms of, uh, So this point, what I've done is I've mounted that normal syringe, lure lock, my little chip in here. And the reason this assembly is important that if some of you get excited about projects and using this for different things, we will change and modify the capillaries because this is a very specific 200 micron. It's not going to have the crayfish larva or mosquito larva pass through. And that's why I have all these other glass capillaries, which have a totally different cross section. So then we would make some of those, we would modify that to make sure that some of them actually are compatible with something that you might wanna flow through this. Uh, okay, so at this point, we're ready. Now I'm just gonna close this. Uh, and then this is the part I wanna be careful about. Fun little things. There are little orientation here. So to assemble, there's a little notch that we created here, just so whenever I remember that I got the orientation right. Uh, and again, you know, I think it's, uh, there is a certain amount of assembly required in whatever you'll make. Assembly required is a great way to reduce cost, but you gotta, uh, there should only be one way people should put, be able to put something together. Just a simple, very simple principle to think about. Uh, okay, at this point, we're ready to connect, pump this and turn things in. So I'm just connecting that to the pump. I'm assuming you all kind of heard and saw just uh, the thread around, uh, there's my part. Uh, and again, it's the most important thing that matters is that the we often clean the tubing afterwards because if you are making a sample and a measurement of one location, you left it contaminated, you loaded something else, and you associate an object first. Yes. Say that again. Oh, we usually just uh, uh water just clean fresh water because we care about viability of this. So you don't need anything else. Just, yeah, I think small ble bleach is useful sometimes if it's gunked up, but nothing else. Okay, so at this point, the plumbing is all done. Uh, it's all connected. Uh, you can just see sample reservoir, chip, walk through a tubing. This is a very fun peristaltic pump after trying hundreds of pumps we settled on this uh, the reason we like it 
is you can open it and actually change the tube that's inside. So when this wears out, you just put the second tube and it's brand new again because the pumping efficiency is not dependent on the motor but on this tube. So this tube wraps around here and I can just open it and replace it. So it's kind of just tons of replacement parts that are easy to get. Okay, so now the fun begins. Uh, I'm assuming all of this you roughly saw last time. I'm gonna turn it on. There's only one button on the machine, nothing else. It turns orange. Uh, we are ready to go. And now we're going to use a computer to connect it to or an iPhone. So you can see it's a microscope, but there is nothing to look at. So it requires a screen. Another trick or mechanism for reducing cost. Screens cost a lot, but people carry screens around in their pocket. If you can, and what you're thinking about, change that so that anybody can use a screen that they have. It's fairly useful. I think that general principle doesn't apply for medical devices. Uh, there's a lot of things in conversations and interviews we have done with people where they don't want to use their phone. If you're a doctor somewhere out there uh, and the medical device requires your phone, there's a little bit of worry around contamination and just your personal phone versus work. So might as well actually provide a phone with something that you're thinking about. Uh, the machine is creating a Wi-Fi. So at this point, I can go and connect to that Wi-Fi. It's called Planktoscope. Uh, and now, once it's connected, you probably would want to come in on this side if you want to see the screen. So uh, you guys can hover a little bit on this side, and then I'll connect. Oh, if I do that, then I can't do the Zoom. Uh, because now I am on the machine's Wi-Fi, so we'll just use the screen. Uh, and if I go in here and I type... Local 1880, that's the port and UI. I am now connected to the machine. So effectively, now you are inside the setup. And one of the first things we can do is we can start with the culture. Actually, no, let's start with this one. Uh, we will filter this a little bit. It's going to have a lot of sediments to begin with, too, but it'll be kind of fun to play with. Uh, I'm just going to go in and We'll walk through this in a little bit. Let's just first do a quick set of a uh, sample to what do you actually see? What are the optical resolutions kind of, and then we'll come back. Uh, another design criteria is because we want everybody to do this in a geotag manner. We force people to encode the location of the sample. So whosoever, who collected this one? Do you know where it's from? Well, you know where that puddle is? So from your phone, if you go and you take a picture of that, in that metadata is the GPS coordinates. And the way we built this, even for citizens, uh, we want people to map exactly where they collect something because every one of them can then be a kind of a data set that could become very important because that might have never been associated. Yes? I think a lot of, basically all phones now that have GPS will record metadata for a phone photograph. I mean, you can also go in maps and find it. There's lots of apps for it, but always just any photo is sufficient for you to find the geo coordinate later. Like if I'm collecting a lot, I'll just take a ton of photo from wherever I collect. Yeah, and so you can really get, uh, and but the way this is structured and a lot of users started complaining first but later on, they realized we're trying to make casual users into people that make scientific grade observations so that friction is important. And so similarly, you're working on a medical kind of a device or something. There might be some things that your users might not be used to that you are forcing because you care about the quality and the usability of that data. There is a hidden trick in here for how I, uh, I'm not going to put that for right now. I'll just do it as a test. Uh, so that uh, we can just move ahead. Uh, 
So I'm going to now rush through a little bit to just actually get to the point. There is a button for light. I'm going to turn the light on. The illumination is turned on. It's important to understand that uh, uh, I talked about microscopy, you know, when uh, Benedict had also talked through certain sets of threads. A microscope is two microscopes connected together. The way you collect light, which is all here, is equally important to how you illuminate. Right now, we're just literally using a surface mount, uh, true board LED. Uh, there's no condenser lens, so this optim it's the optical illumination is not optimized at all. Very simple. Anybody who wants to, that's like a two, three day project to say, oh, how do I make a really small Kohler illumination that will illuminate? So there will also be an objective on this side. Right now, we're just using the curved LED packaging as its illuminator. It's good. It can be far improved. Uh, but again, you know, it's just kind of a thread to think about. Literally, what you do here is also something that you do on the illumination side. So at this point, there is already an image on the screen. There's no sample in here. So let's just start by loading a sample. And then we're just going to flush the line. And my intuition is that uh, this only has a few big pieces. Hope do you have a falcon tube here? Just so that if I want to filter this once. Um, yeah, there's going to see a ton of sediments in this, which is also quite fun. Uh, I just. No, 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 I want to, it'll be a fun surprise. So we'll see. Oh, but that's salt water, right? No, 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 we don't need to borrow that. We can, we can get a falcon tube. Uh, Hope, the falcon tubes are right where my shelf is on the other side, uh, just on the opposite side. Actually, because this is marine, maybe I'll put this one first, because this will be sensitive to the aquatic shock. Uh, I'll have to flush the line, and I want to make sure you guys actually see. Uh, there's nothing, maybe if there is a dark room, we might actually see. There's no way to shut the lights down there. What's the closest place where, are these things dark? Do you guys know if this opens? It looks like as if something like this should open. Uh, the about the thing that you're about to see is bioluminescent, and it's really fun. Uh, but uh, it's not dark enough, I think. Here, okay. Let me check. Uh, yeah, there's too much light. Um, okay, maybe we can do it post this uh, once we finish. Let's just take a look at what it is. So, you know, you see something turbid. Right, so one of the things that we're gonna just try to do is uh, load that in. You would write the amount of sample because you're trying to figure out quantitatively how many cells were there in this volume of water, right? This could be urine, for example. So if any of you wanna work on, say, I had mentioned to you, we do this schistosomiasis screening. When kids pee, eggs come out and so we go do screening in schools where we would have falcon tubes from 50 kids. 20 of them probably are positive of shishto. And then you would process and sample that. And then the machine would be around counting the number of shishto eggs in their urine. Uh, so at this point now, since we have loaded, uh, I can choose the flow rate here. I'll just choose uh, 0 0.5 ml per minute. And then I turn the pump on, and you can see it's continuously pumping. And the first time, you don't see anything there because you can see the interface is just starting because, of course, the system has an, a giant air bubble. And at some point of time, we will see right there. So already, uh, so I don't know if you guys can actually see on the screen. So uh, this is really fun. I'm just going to stop it for one second. Uh, I already said it's a pure culture, so you can see all the cells look very similar. And uh, so now you can see the their crescent. We call them moons. 
uh, and uh, that's also in the species name. Uh, you could also see other things. I mean, of course, these are the bulk of the cells. You'll see that the cells have different shapes, but you also see these debris. Uh, these could be dead. So if you're starting to classify, and then the one simple thing I see is it's sharp, but it could be sharper, the image. So I'm just going to go and check here to change my focus. So when I click on these two buttons right here, it's going to change the motor here to just automatically focus to see whether it gets sharper. So you can tell me when I do that, does it get blurry or sharper? It got blurry, right? Very clearly, right? I think it's hard to see there, but here you can see it got blurry. So I went the wrong way. I'm gonna go the same right there. I think that's the sharpest. Uh, and again, you know, I could do much, much finer, but there is a certain limit to it because the thickness, the depth of focus of the microscope is roughly the depth that's associated with the uh, capillary. If we end up doing this for counting mosquito larvae, we will change the thickness of the capillary, but then I might also change the objective to be a lower mag objective that has bigger depth of focus because then otherwise there is no way. Classically, what's done in flow cytometry is there is also a mechanism, hydrodynamic, it's called hydrodynamic focusing, where you can bring the object in the focus plane so you can have a higher mag objective that's looking in a sharper plane. For reducing cost, we don't do that. We just have it come through and we choose an objective that has a depth, bigger depth of focus. Otherwise, there is a lot more gadgetry that would be needed to do flow focusing. So at this point, if you're happy, you can basically start collecting data. So I could go in into the next continue here, uh, set a certain set of parameters. Uh, I have a certain amount of total volume I want to image. This is the total pump volume. Uh, I have named something. It says, oh, this is the number of images that I'm going to acquire. Uh, and then I can start acquisition and just walk away at this point. And so this is the whole point of this story is that this could be all on your phone or is on your phone effectively because this is, the compute is all here. We're just using this as a screen. So you don't actually need a computer to run it. This runs on uh, the battery that I was telling you. So we didn't have to be here. We didn't have to actually collect the sample and come down here we could do the assessment of that sample out in the field. And then that data set is collected here. You could go on your hike, map as many number of places, and then analysis can be done later on. So I'm just gonna start it just to show you. And then the more fun is let's jump to the other sample just so you have a sense for what else might be there. So if I just hit start acquisition, uh, oh, it's I have to rename because this file is uh, already taken. Uh, I'll just do bio E337 and let's just do a quick. So this is called a kind of stop flow microscopy. And so what it's doing is it moves, it stops the pump, takes a picture, it moves, it stops the pump, takes a picture. Why are we? Can you guess why are we stopping the pump? Why why would we want to use this approach? Uh, anybody online? You can all see that something moves, it stops, takes a picture, flushes. Yeah. Yeah, you you we want to quantitatively establish density. So we want to count all the cells. If you just had a rolling image running, I don't know between those two images whether the same cells showed up twice. Computationally, there are other tricks that you can play. There's also a trick called strobing that you can play. But by making sure that everybody that was in the first photo is told to leave the room and then the next group comes and then you take the photo, we ensure 
that the total volume that we imaged, no object in that volume was the same. You can also do it computationally if everybody is just walking always and you just keep taking pictures at certain frequency, but then you have to figure out, oh, this cell particularly traveled this distance and these two cells are the same. So you can see that you could double count accidentally. And so this is a very simple trick. Again, I was telling you all about hardware, software uh, changes. You can implement something in hardware, software that could save cost in hardware. So strobing would require me to have a, kind of an entire electronic control to be able to strobe in time, but then I can do something like that in software. So I think all kinds of tricks to play with, but the key idea is that we want it to be computationally. So it can already see that within the last less than a minute, it's collected 60% of that data, uh, we can let this run for a second, and I'm going to filter the second sample uh, to make sure that I am removing things that are more than 200 microns, because the 200 micron was the bound for the capillary, right? Because otherwise, I do know things will jam, right? So at this point, uh, we are ready for trying the new sample. Uh, and again, you know, I think... There is a lot of things that we are building on this platform, including getting it to be out at sea in an autonomous boat, all kinds of threads around diagnostics applications. I think we talked a little bit about microplastics, larval conservation side of the story. Uh, so it's fun. If any of you are interested in thinking about the class project, choose an application, but then what you end up doing is building on an open hardware sets of accessories that enable and make that possible. Like it might be that you're just using the fluidics and the imaging chassis and you build and design something completely different that mounts there. That's perfectly okay. And I think, you know, I mean, uh, there is also for folks that might be excited about more machine learning context to this, uh, there is a massive amount of compute things that we still have to do, especially the big area that we are just starting now is real-time compute. So right now, uh, the capture is done. Uh, then I have to segment, and then we run an ML engine on top of it to do the IDs. Uh, imagine all of that happening, which some of you have seen on Octopi. Remember, I did the demo from Senegal. The machine was telling you real time, this is a parasite. So that's the same framework that we are building now on this system, uh, which is also really fun because it kind of gives us the sense of um, uh, being able to tell and give feedback to a person right then and there. So I'm going to take this sample out. And then now mount one of your samples, and we're going to see what we see. Uh, and between the two, if I was doing this properly, I would have just done a flush. Uh, but because this is just a test, uh, this is seawater. Uh, that's fresh water. So the first sets of organisms that interface won't be very happy because the salinity is different. Uh, but, you know, I think it's okay. Uh, and then if one of you can hold this for a second, actually, no, maybe I'll do the other way around. Uh, if you hold that and that, and it is possible that some of it is going to leak on your hands. Yeah. So... I don't know what kind of puddle this was collected on, but that's sufficient, actually. OK, so now I've just made sure. And yeah, it kind of looks like a ton of uh, particulates. So load that in. Uh, we do the same thing. I'm just going to go back for a second here. Uh, now the system is in place and I'm just going to flush for a little bit until my new sample shows up. And I would never do this if I was collecting data. You should first put clean water, <laughs> flush the system out, 
No, this is, okay. Now something has dramatically changed. So uh, let's just stop it for a second. So you can immediately see this idea of ecosystems. Uh, so this is a massive, uh, let's just go in and here. This was not in this ecosystem, but you're starting to see these types of structures. Do you see these? These are very common structures. Does anybody want to guess? What could that be? Huh? Algae? Yeah. But uh, why this fractal? It doesn't look like an organism. Do you all see fractals there? Right? Do you see these fractal-like structures? Uh, this is a classic thing that happens in all aquatic ecosystems. Uh, this is not self-propelled. There are just pressure differences in there. Uh, but at some point of time, we'll also see things that are propelling. Uh, but what ends up happening is when life in an aquatic ecosystem dies, many algae, many particulates, they start aggregating, kind of like snow. So in the ocean, it's called marine snow. Uh, in this scenario, it's kind of aquatic snow. But it is made of living matter, and it's the debris and the fecal pellets. And this is what keeps an ecosystem alive in some sense. So all the other things will eat these amalgams. And also carbon sequestration is really, actually I did talk a little bit about that, right? Remember the biological pump? So this is an equivalent of a biological pump in a small pond or a puddle. Uh, let's uh, flush it a little more. Uh, and you can see now processing the sample is a lot more complicated, right? Uh, I can see a little bit of backflow uh, because what that it would do is when I segment every one of the dots would actually get quantitatively placed. And then you would get this massive histogram to show the distribution of my particulate sizes. Uh, there might be certain features here that you can't identify because they are not so shape specific. Uh, many of the organisms in there that I see uh, are probably below the resolution. Like many of these algae even are below the resolution. So they just get quantified by size and biomass. So it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, ideal case scenario, like when I see something like that, I would want to put an objective that's higher magnification. So I could start getting a little more uh, features. Uh, OK, so questions, comments, threads, because I want to move to diagnostics a little bit too. But uh, any comments online, questions? Uh, so, I, hello. Yeah. Uh, so the way that you look for flow rate is just dependent on how much total sample you have and how much of it do you want to image. The more you image, the better your quantitative understanding of number of cells of every species per unit microliter. So, but on the other hand, you also don't want a massive amount of data sets because every data set is a lot of data to process. So essentially you're looking at, this is the pumped volume and uh, it tells you the total pump volume. So currently I have it set that with 100 images, I'm only imaging, you can see 0.14 ml of the actual volume, and I have around 5 ml here. Uh, and effectively, this is 1.9 ml, because when I do the stop flow, I use some amount of flow to flush it out. And so I can change these ratios. And if I just say, oh, I really want to image a lot more, I can make this 1,000. And you can now see that the total volume here is 19 ml. So then I am actually imaging 2 ml of that as uh, every single cell in those two MLs, but they're all mixed. The assumption is that this is homogeneous. There's also a little pump. Uh, this is just an air pump, and we have a tube, and we add a bubbler here to make sure that everything is well mixed, because there might be in your cultures things that will settle down and things that will speed up. So you don't want to bias. The heavier stuff will come first, the lighter stuff might remain, and you might say the lighter stuff doesn't exist. So we also just bubble it for that reason. There was a question? 
Oh, that you were talking about the like practice stuff, like how they're uh-huh. aquatics now, which is made up of like debris and poop and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Are they also living stuff too? Okay, yeah. that was my question. Like, yeah. if they're composed of living organisms, massive number of so every one of these will probably have ten thousand bacteria. These are hot spots of bacteria. We in our lab we call them floating guts. It's just like a microbiome, except it's exposed. It's dynamic. It grows and shrinks, it's eaten, but there's this massive amalgam of stuff that's happening. Uh, and every one of them is a little ecosystem. So if I was to do metagenomics on this and this, oh, somebody came along. Did you guys see that? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, and it's in a density side, it's quite low for me to think about that. Okay, let's just pump a lot more. Uh, oh, go ahead, Pavan. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'm imagining this or is it an, a camera artifact that okay. only in the marine one, the it goes, there's a lot of back and forth motion instead of one directional motion. There's a lot of uh, like also drift when it's static. It yeah. did not happen in the freshwater. Am I imagining this or it's really the case? No, I think what's happening is once I run something, when it's static, there is no pressure and there is a bubble that I know that got trapped. And if you all want to come, you can see right there, there's a little bubble. Do you see it? And it's almost breathing. Do you see that? Right here. It's breathing. So, Pavan, there is a bubble that's trapped in. It deforms, but then it reacts. So these oscillations that you're seeing, and the very simple trick for that is I lift it up and I tap, 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 tap to kind of get the bubbles out. So just often when you start, you want to make sure that you remove bubbles from the system. Uh, So that's really where that artifact is coming from. That has nothing to do with which kind of sample. The other place something like that could happen is that this is a very dense sample. So you could imagine that it could pile up in, and that's why this, straight design, there are no bends in this because we're trying to avoid any place something could get trapped. Also to make sure that it cleans easily because we want to use this for diagnostic applications and we really want to make sure that we don't take two people's urine and tell the results from one from the other because there was a pathogen that was stuck. So in that case, we essentially do a quick bleach. Uh, Other questions? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, so you choose the flow rate, uh, and the flow rate is what determines uh, what is called rheotaxis, this idea that an organism can fight back flow. Uh, it can only fight back flow to a certain extent. And so if this was filled with stuff, they would still be passive for this much amount of flow rate. So you can tune that. Uh, If you're running very, very slow, many bacteria like to go against the flow, and you would see them coming from your waistline, coming upstream, kind of like trout, right? Many fish like to go upstream. Bacteria do that too, but you can tune the flow rate. Uh, At this flow rate, there's almost nothing that can come upstream. Yeah, it's just, it's tuning. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think that's all I want to say, unless there was another burning question. I think the reason we spend so much time on this platform is now we are scaling this platform and it's broadly available to everybody around the world. Uh, Many of these units are in the Arctic, Antarctica. We have around 150 or so units. And everybody that engages builds on top of it. The project is completely open source. There's a ton of computational things people can do. Uh, You could get excited about the diagnostic thing. I am looking to find a small group of students who are excited about schistosomiasis uh, because we have a clinical validation study coming up in Senegal. There's a little bit of an ML. So if you enjoy and just you want to use that as an excuse to learn ML, that's actually a pretty viable, pretty straightforward thing to do. Uh, If you enjoy assembly and you kind of say, oh, I want to learn optics, you could say, I'll build a new module for this, which will fit in the same framework, 
but allows us to do, say, a 20x objective or a 40x objective. So I think uh, it's valuable. The best way to learn is not just to start projects from scratch, because they take, I mean, this is uh, five and a half years to get here from a conceptual idea. And so then many of the, I want you all to choose projects and run with projects. Hello? But in parallel, you should also just choose, oh. It's your earphone, no, I don't know. Who called now? It's unknown. I no, guess no, somebody's, no, uh, it's unknown, somebody's it's mic is turned on. Was that you, Ravi? OK. <laughs> uh, so I think you know that part is important. Just like when you learn to code, you say, let me go into somebody's code base and write a little function. Hardware is exactly the same way. And this is why I'm also just saying, as you're choosing projects, try to help and take ownership of a small module in somebody's project. And if any of you are excited about projects that we are showing, we're always looking for people to take ownership of a small module and build, because that way you kind of get to know what it takes to work in a team. What does it take to actually achieve something? Because it's all good. We can all spend a ton of time thinking. There is a big difference between thinking and saying, no, I am putting my time on the line. There is going to be something at the end of the day. If there is nothing at the end of the day that leaves this campus, all of this is useless. It's still good you all learn. That's fine. <laughs> but the true learning comes in is like, you. Know, I know you're heading out to summer in the field. If you have an idea that you can take there and says, ah, you know, I brought something here. I'm here for feedback. I learned something along the way. That part is incredibly important. I can't emphasize. And this is why it's valuable that, uh, like, you know, I'm not assigning homeworks to anybody, but you can very easily self-assign a homework and say, oh, for this week, I'm just going to really take one of the modules that Benedict had shown, and I'm going to design a module that doesn't exist. It's a pretty important homework. These are real homeworks, because the module that you made, somebody might actually use it. Uh, which is kind of an important part of all this. Okay, so I think that's all I want to say. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to switch to diagnostics. We want to tell you about a very exciting project that we're working on. I'll cover the theory and a lot of the description of it, uh, but it's fun to have you all actually see uh, how to build a diagnostic device from scratch. Uh, this is a new device. It's called SnapDX. Uh, so unless, is there a question here? Because then I'm going to switch and let Nesta and Hope run a little bit. Of, I'll give a quick intro, but then we'll walk through an assembly. Any questions here? You're all good? Okay, so we'll switch context, and we'll spend some time on uh, what we call SnapDX. And uh, I'll kind of do a little bit of a theory and a history of this on Tuesday, so you guys can all move on this side. Uh, but the thread around here is, uh, you know, this object exists only because of an obsession of a few of us, including Anesta, me, Hope, Adam, a couple other people in the lab, and a huge network of people. Uh, the goal that we started with around, is that fair to say now, three and a half years ago? Or I always forget how far COVID was. Okay, three years ago, whatever. Some time ago, although we've been working on this goal almost for 10 years, around that time, we asked ourselves a question. Is it possible to build a framework for a molecular diagnostic test that has the same sets of ease of use and completely untethered, no infrastructure required like an RDT, but has a molecular testing? So it's amplification. It can be programmed and it is as precise as a classic amplification test. But, uh, you know, of course, there is a lot of work that people have done in molecular diagnostics, but molecular diagnostics still hasn't left the labs or even hospitals. We've been thinking about community health, screening applications, all kinds of things in mapping marine biodiversity, for example. Uh, and one of the principles and goals around this was uh, again, because we start with price, something for a price point for a dollar to be able to do all the gadgetry 
that can do multi-step reactions all the way to amplification, but also do it with no other infrastructure required. So the object that you're seeing is all there is. Uh, and the joke that we have amongst us is if you know how to make a cup of tea, you can actually run the test. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, you guys can show maybe a few sets of pictures and a little bit of a background because it'll be useful, but spend more time on the assembly of the device. And then we will pick up the nitty gritty of how does it actually work on Tuesday. And then I have to run. So I'm going to pack that, pass that to Adam. And then uh, I know just run as far as you can, and then we'll just still pick up on Tuesday. But kind of bias towards having people feel. Uh, so when COVID happened, uh, Anesta and I built a massive team. It was volunteers across campus. We just sent out people uh, messages because we ran a massive validation trial for this in the Palo Alto area. Uh, we made roughly around 10,000 of these tests. So you're just seeing a tiny portion of the massive production that we built because we wanted to understand what does it take to build at scale. Uh, and for that, we recruited a volunteer team. And actually, at the peak of the team, it was roughly around 20, 25 people. All of this, huh? Yeah, literally this room, because we took over all of the teaching space because nobody was teaching here. And we essentially built a diagnostic factory. And what we were trying to understand is what would it take? And that taught us a ton of things that are now going in into uh, what Hope and Nesta and several of us are working on, which is how do you enable distributed manufacturing of diagnostics anywhere in the world? So what we can do here, we are now trying to do that in two shipping containers. And then what we can do in those two shipping containers, we can port and do that anywhere in the world. So that's kind of the big project that we are now taking is literally enabling manufacturing of molecular diagnostic. And we're not there yet. There's lots of kinks and things that we are working on, but it requires everything from every enzyme, every lysate, every little thing is built in that same infrastructure. Um, yeah, and I think, so you will just see the process of what we did when we built the assembly line of course, all of that assembly line was manual at that time. We're planning to turn that all into robotic. So what you will do, robots will do at a later time. But it's fun for you to still actually get a little bit hands-on. Um, you guys can disassemble or I don't know how many units you guys want to make. Yeah. If they are good, they can actually make a ton of units. Could be used. Okay. All right. So what you're about to assemble will be used in a validation study, so please follow instructions carefully, okay? A mistake you make is an invalid test that cost us something, so take this seriously. Yes? All right, yeah, so let's just, yeah, let's just recruit them to actually go through. Uh, okay, I'm gonna leave this uh, with Hope and Anesta, and I think, yeah, you guys should definitely do a little bit of a background, but much of the detailed stuff, we will do, like all the assay, how does the assay work, much of the physics of the device, all of that we'll cover on Tuesday. But you guys can cover the parts and the broader vision. Say that again. I can give you the mic. I don't need that. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Great. So what Manu was just mentioning right now about distributed manufacturing of SnapDX, this is a CAD drawing that an estimate a while ago of what it could possibly look like. And so when you're thinking about manufacturing, you have to think about all of the associated equipment with it. And so what do you need for purification of the enzymes for the lamp assay? What do you need to store the reagents? And there's an important distinction to think about that this diagnostic SNAP-DX doesn't use any electricity to run. But then when you're manufacturing SNAP-DX, you will need some sort of power source, whether it's solar power or battery power. And so maybe we can start with a little bit of background and go through the slides. Yeah. Question for all of you. How many of you are familiar with PCR? Also online as well. Oh, everybody. Cool. Cool. You guys all did the color test. 
Well, we have some first year students. Oh, who okay, do yeah. Not, who do oh. not have to do that. Oh, the Stanford? Yeah, the college. But I'm sure they were doing it from home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe at their own. Oh, there's a lot of swimming pools in here, by the way. See what you see on that picture that's not here is actually the cup. Forgot to bring it up, but that's the inflated cup that Manu was mentioning. So it is very much like making it a cup of tea or coffee. And so, really, what motivates this project? There's a couple of different reasons, but when you think about climate change, it's really changing the weed dynamics around the world, and the countries that are going to be most affected by it are low and middle income. You see that by the yellow area next to South America and a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of sub-Saharan Africa as well. And then when you think about delivering diagnostics to those areas in the global south, how does that happen? You first have to manufacture those diagnostics, and that manufacturing occurs, much of it occurs in the global north. So the top 14 diagnostics dist distributors are in North America, are in Europe. There's one in Japan. There, sorry, there's a yeah. package down here. If you want the mic. Yeah, you can be there. Okay. I need to do this. Okay. This is Rachel's okay. phone. I think this will be important for assembly. Maybe not right now. Yeah. And so for people who want to look at the numbers, I know we did that by the numbers assignment a few weeks ago. There were 3.2 billion tests performed during COVID. This is a cross-sectional time point. And out of those 3.2 billion tests, only 0.4% were performed in low and middle income countries. So you kind of see the disparity there and the gap that we're trying to fill. And we can take inspiration from actually vaccine manufacturing. So if you remember the COVID-19 vaccine, when it was made, um, the distribution was also very inequitable. And so that's what spurred the product or the formation of the African Vaccine Manufacturing Network. And so you see all these locations around the world, more of them low income countries where manufacturing facilities started popping up so that they could produce their own mRNA vaccines rather than rely on foreign supply chains to deliver them to them. And that still is a, what is the right word for it? I don't want to sound negative, but uh, this is still an ambition. It doesn't exist yet. A lot of entities have been thinking about it. There has been a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of gesturing about it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that there is any single functional entity where true mRNA vaccine production technology has actually been captured and yet. So it's, you know, this is a complex issue. It intermingles with a lot of threats around IP. We deal with the same thing. There's a lot of IP that we have on this. We try to build and design something that uh, we can scale in a sustainable manner to make sure that it's supported uh, requires many pieces to work. But on the other hand, the end goal is very clear. Products should be made uh, as broadly as possible. Otherwise, we can't scale the we can't scale the network. So I think I really like this, but I actually know for many of those types of entities that it's all work in progress. It's very far from the finish line. It's delivering a lot of work. Yes, and maybe also another important note is that there's a lot of attention right now on vaccine manufacturing, but less so on diagnostic manufacturing. And so we want to think of diagnostics also as a very important part of healthcare products in general, and they serve as a very important decision-making tool as well. And so here's where we get to SNAP-DX, and it's a molecular diagnostic that you can perform in the field. Anesta can hold one up.
that's not a completed unit. Yeah. It's like maybe 90%. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so in Liberia, if you all remember the Ebola outbreaks that were occurring largely in West Africa a few years ago, or now almost a, a decade ago, which is very strange to think about, but Liberia was one of the countries that was hardest hit by the Ebola outbreaks, and they did not have the healthcare infrastructure to support diagnosing the patients or treating the patients. And the issue was that a lot of the population of Liberia lives in rural areas, but then the main diagnostic and laboratory centers are in the capital of Monrovia. And so what people had to do is they would bring patient samples in coolers on the back of motorcycles and drive all the way across the country, maybe four or five hours to deliver those samples to those labs in the capital so that they could be diagnosed. And then they would have to drive all the way back to deliver the, the message. So that was in 2014. In 2022, which is when Manu and I went to Liberia, not much has changed. There was a lot of foreign aid that went and helped help the Liberians during the Ebola outbreak in 2014. But after that foreign aid left, then kind of the temporary structures they put in place collapsed. And so in 2022, you still see um, this community health worker packing up a truck. They call it a, a tuk-tuk. And so he's packing up a truck filled with syringes and gloves and sanitary supplies to drive out to the, to the village. And what they do is they take blood samples from anybody who has a fever, and then they bring it back to this laboratory to do diagnosis of it. Um, there's a high chance that they have either malaria or some other uh, neglected tropical disease. And so here's where we kind of get into SNAPDX design and validation. And what we're really moving toward is scalability of reagents. I think now we can switch to assembly. What, what we're going to go through is a lot of, you know, what's on the slides, and it might be helpful for you to show all the parts, because then they will know roughly what's in there. So I don't know whether the figure, I think we, the paper we figure, yeah, right? but just just the raw sketch. Yeah, but I can pull it up. Yeah, very friendly to a design person. They obviously want to be affordable, very low cost, very easy to to work with. So no no. It's all simple maneuvers like pushing, twisting, pulling. Um, no, con uh, no contamination that you cannot have a leakage in the unit itself. So you know, like when they was mentioning before, where you have to switch still samples from two different patients, we do want to flush it out. So instead of flushing things out, we want to make sure that no sample um, gets out during the amplification process. Because if you amplify your DNA, right, there's like tons of tons of copies that are called amplicons, and if they get released, then your next sample becomes very contaminated, and it's just very, very difficult. Oh, no, it's trillions and trillions yeah. of amplicons. So any space that's contaminated, this is one of the biggest issues in Liberia right now. Right? The air, everything is contaminated at that point. And so this is what's different from an RDT. RDT doesn't spew out the signal to spread across all of the tests that might be required. Should I pull up the? Yeah. Um, I think we do have it. I yeah, don't just, think uh, so. No, but you can go pull in. Up. There might be just one image in there. Keep going. Keep going. I don't think I put it. Okay, okay this is the BMS. Yeah. 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 Yep. But you can. You can just use that image to talk through it. Actually, just sure. just use this image. Yeah. To talk about the parts, and then yeah. you guys can just go through them. So what you can see is basically in the basic essence, you have a tube and a tube, right? So you have the inner piece here, which we're calling the plunger, and then you have what we call the body right now. So we have the body with the two caps, so one blue and one clear, just to indicate which side is which, because only one side would be used for sample collection. I'm um, just going to first talk about just the general components of it first, and then I'll talk about how it will, um, how a user would use it and how the things that are happening inside of it. I'm wondering um, if you can also be oh, in front of the camera. I don't, I can't see what this is, but, um. Oh, I so can. We can make that happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just a general comment. Uh, the idea of this design is this notion of building a Russian doll. Yeah. 
we want to start with a sample. We want it to be as general as possible, anywhere from saliva to blood to urine to vaginal swab, anything you can imagine that sample that has information. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that that sample, once collected, never is exposed outside, so it has to be sealed. And then there are multiple chambers that that sample processes and goes through because we want to do different types of chemistry. Unlike in uh, RDT or a lateral flow, everything just carries a long line, but there is a contiguous connection. You can't have that in molecular testing. So there can be reagents in your sample that essentially inhibit the amplification process, mm -hmm. like blood, for example, has a ton of iron. It's very difficult to then have that run in in an application. So you want to be able to have true separation. Mm -hmm. So the object is a, is a crazy creation of chambers inside chambers that are truly sealed from each other. And there is a mechanism that drives fluids from one to the other in a sequential manner. Mm -hmm. And that's why it looks uh, the way it looks uh, is because we're trying to create different types of cavities. So there's a cavity for lysis, there's a cavity for capture of reagents and DNA and RNA, and then there is a cavity for amplification, and then there is a readout hole. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of what's hidden inside many of these objects. Um, okay, so as Manu mentioned, it's a, a series of chambers within. So, but just to make it more visual, so you have here on the kind of top half or top third is the sample chamber. This is where for for this validation we use saliva samples. So we had a little funnel which I don't have here, but you would put a funnel here and you would just um, deposit about two mL of sample in here. Um, we would close it, tighten it close, and. And here, this is an empty chamber, so this is like just a gaseous chamber. Um, the reason why this is here is because then we can also, um, the reagents, which is not in these units because we don't have the reagents, but like if you can imagine for a second a small capillary about the size of... Oh, we could bring one old unit from the cold From the cold room? room. Yeah. yeah. Hope if you want but, to go bring a unit from the cold room... Essentially, yeah, so essentially... It's a slightly older design, but it's useful. Yeah, maybe they may have some of the reagents in there, but if you can imagine just, you know, some bit of liquid there that has the entire uh, reagents. Uh, we're not going to go in detail into those reagents. I think Manu will go through that on Tuesday, but it's basically like PCR, but it operates in a single temperature. So rather than, you know, multiple temperatures, this operates at around 63 to 67 degrees Celsius. Um, I'm sorry. And we have... Most of you might have heard, this is a lab. <laughs> All act actual color was all yeah. special. Yeah. It was not PCR. Um, yeah, so you would have reagents in there and it would be hosted kind of inside here. Um, we didn't put them in because we don't have the reagents in, but essentially it would go kind of like this. And we have a little foam piece that goes in to hold it in place. Um, so with those reagents in there, and when, so right now, if you are. COVID positive for the sample, so your sample is definitely infected. And if you are someone else, maybe it's the nurse or your healthcare worker who is doing this for a group of students in school, you don't want to get infected as well, right? Just because you're handling such things. So once the sample is inside here, it should not be, it should never have you to open this device at, at all again. So a lot of the molecular diagnostics that are out there right now requires you as part of the sample preparation to open each of the tubes and pipette out from each step to the next to the next. And a lot of those can cause you know this added con contamination along the way. So we don't want that at all, and we don't want to add added you know we don't have added risk to the person operating it as well. So once it's closed, it's closed. It just stays in the device. Um, you'd wipe it clean, disinfect it, and this is where you would um attach it to a uh I don't have a cup right now, but you know, let's just say this is a coffee cup. You would um attach it in in like that, just you know all the way in, and you would pour boiling water up to about this point. So your sample, once you have the 2 ml sample, it's roughly about this line. Once you pour the water, it should reach around between that line and this line. And the the heat and activation kills the virus, basically makes it, the, so the DNA, the DNA and RNA of the virus are still there. It's just that they're not active, so they're no longer infectious. So we put that for about five minutes, and that's a typical protocol that the CDC does as well for all samples that they also work in the lab. Um, so once that is done, um, uh, what you don't see right now is inside of each of the plungers are these two small holes. Did you see those? Two small holes. Yes, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, 
Can you guys see that? I can't really see what you guys are seeing right now. We don't need the screen anymore. Just do a yeah. spot of the, just unshare the screen. Okay. Can I, can I see what this Yeah, no, like but is? just unshare this. We don't need a screen here, so. Stop sharing. Okay. Okay, cool. Now you yeah, so you can see the two tiny holes there. So what's happening is not only is your sample being inactivated when it's in the, in the boiling water, um, a little bit of sample gets also pushed. So imagine the, the little gas that's above your sample gets expanded. So then a lot, it pushes some of the sample through these tiny holes. So now it's entering these, this third chamber, which is inside the plunger itself, uh, which happens to also be where this guy is, right? So while it's being heated, um, a lot of things are happening, right? Your samples are boiling, it's, uh, it's being inactivated. A little bit of sample enters this area, but at the same time, you have your reagents that are still sitting in the same exact unit that cannot see high temperature prior to the reaction starting because then, it, then when you want it to react, it doesn't react anymore. So this gaseous chamber actually serves as an insulator. So once it's in the hot water, it's trapped inside a gaseous chamber, right? It's inside the plunger in this empty um, container, you can see here, um, so that the heat doesn't see as much of the heat as it does, you know, uh, the main the main chamber here. Um, and then once that happens, the the little bit of sample that enters the unit gets um, in contact with the, the the reagents that are in here. So basically, you push this little button. Um, it bends. You can see that it bends here, and as you can see, there's a white stick in there. Um, so what hap uh, This white stick can move. So it, this is. This is glued on, but the white stick actually goes up and down. I don't know if you can see, but it does go up and down. The, the cap is glued on, but the stick is freely moving in there. What you all, what is also inside, which I'll push here for a second. Can you guys see through that? There's a little clear item in there, a small thing. That is basically this. It's a PDMS seal. Um, I'll pass a couple around. It's very small. Um, these are just silicone, um, basically, and these are used in the, um, in the lab a lot because it is just very chemically inert. You can control how hard and how soft that is. It's just like making jello, but the opposite of, instead of cooling it to harden it, you just heat it and it cures. So it creates all these cross linkages to form the kind of gel-like structure. And I you should have heard about microfluidics, all of that is made out of PDMS. Mm -hmm. It's also the most biocompatible yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. Very, very. Uh, it's compatible to the implanted. Mm -hmm. um, so once it's in there, what it does is. So I'm going to run. Yeah. I'll yeah. Ask you guys. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Sounds good. While you were at it, we should have told you to bring a cup. Oh, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We'll just use that. Yeah. So people actually know. I think there is a little bit of product design in, in this perspective. Of we want to build tests with materials that are familiar to people. Yeah, so we're going to bring one for a cup. So it does look like they can set this kind of up. Yeah, it's a little bit taller. It's thicker. Um, you can kind of see a little bit of red. This is old. This is like when you said this is two years old. It's just been sitting in the cold room. Obviously, things have evaporated as well. Um, you can see this little um, red dot there. But before, it was about the length of, let's say, like a quarter inch worth of um, reagents in the side. Um, but anyway, just to reiterate, so after it gets in contact, then you would push this button like, or more like bend it so that you can push this white stick, which then pushes the little silicone seal inside. And right now, the silicone seal sits under the where the holes are. So you can imagine if your sample comes in, it comes in this little cup, right, just above the little seal. Um, and then once there's a sample in there, then you would push the white stick through. So I'll just reenact it outside the device. So imagine this is white, not black. But basically push the seal up, boop, and then now it seals the hole, right? So then now the sample and the reagents all live within the capway inside the plunger in a protected area where it's just sealed. So again, when it's reacting, it's amplifying, there's no way this ample con would escape because it's just in between two little seals. There's another um, silicone seal above, as you can see in this scenario. We don't have it here because obviously I don't have the reagents inside. 
Um, but from that point on, you just stick it back in the hot water that's now cooled to roughly about 65 C and you um, put it in there for about 40 minutes. And in the end, you get a color metric readout. Um, the reason why this one is red, we were using a slightly different dive. I won't go into that detail right now because right now we're using uh, an HNB, which is a hydro hydroxy naphthol blue dye, which turns blue if it's um, positive and remains purple if it's negative. So that's the dye we're using right now. Um, yeah, any questions so far? I know that was a little bit hard to imagine things, but I think when we start assembling it by hand here, you'll see a little bit more of how these things come together. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter if you start at a little bit different temperature and like the temperature kind of like, like throughout the whole assay, like it's still like. It has a range. I think it's roughly 60, 63 to 67. Um, and the temperature, at, at least when it starts, it should be no more than like 67. And we had a little temperature sticker that actually turns certain colors when it reaches that temperature. So when you see the color indication that it is within that range, then you start putting it in. And as long as it's within that range for the first 20 minutes, it's fine. And we have measured the cup temperature when it's closed and it is roughly in that 60 range. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? No. Okay. Um, would you are you guys interested in learning how to assemble these things? It's it takes about I don't know five minutes at this point. Yeah. If you are assembling something, can you please put on the gloves? Because we are gonna use these. Hopefully. Yeah. Um. So we have these bodies here. So what we do? Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, people on Zoom, sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh. What I want to also mention was for the assembly, we have this custom jig. So when we were deploying or building a ton of these, as Manu mentioned, we partnered with BIC. So the reason why Hope also had an image with the ballpoint pen next to the uh, Snap DX was also because we partnered with them and it just ha happens that you know the same way that ballpoint pens are manufactured is also coaxial it's also um, radially sym uh, symmetric so it's very similar and it fits kind of right in line with how they assemble their products as well so that was kind of a nice um, happy partnership at that time and they had helped build this jig which helps put the things those little seals in into the uh, into the plungers much much easier so maybe we start with um just basics getting everyone warmed up putting grommets in here oh okay i think yeah. so yeah okay. oops sorry <laughs> maybe if these are hard we can start with the caps too so if you can see we didn't mention this earlier but these black things that are on the caps in the middle of these things these are grommets um, they look like these. Okay, so I'll just pass a cap around, or one cap for each person and a grommet. Your goal is, you can see that in the grommet, there's a skinny section in the middle. Your goal is to stick that skinny section where the cap is, so then it should be, um, yeah, I don't know how to best explain it. You need that little slot to be where that plastic slot is. So it has to be on top and bottom. So uh, it might take a little bit of practice. Um, I'm just going to put it in my pocket so I don't drop it. Oh, you can see that. Sweet. Get more. Oh, yeah. You guys, you have to kind of pinch it a bit, so make it like an oval. Um, yeah, does everyone have one? Yeah? Okay. So what I do is I give it a little squeeze because it is malleable. And then at least get it kind of anchored on one side. And then kind of use your fingers to push it in. Oh, 
sorry, I broke my glove. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh. Okay. I'll just put on I'll just wear a mismatching one. That's totally okay. How was it? It's okay? Okay, cool. Yeah. This is okay. Was that easy? Yeah? Okay. I'm gonna go a little bit harder now because the next piece are the bodies. Okay, so we do the same thing. This will take a little bit more trick because you gotta really stick your finger in there. But I think in two minutes you'll figure it out. So I'll give these out. How many are there? Yes. Okay, you have enough. You have enough. I brought yeah. 14. Oops, sorry. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's it's the same piece, but just to warm up your fingers a little bit. <laughs> okay. Let us know when you're done with those. <laughs> Very therapeutic after a while. So same thing, you gotta do the squeeze, put it in, and then you gotta like just tickle it in. Oh, you got it? Oh, nice. Nice. You're the first, the first one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna recruit you for more assembly. Okay. And I guess we can have everyone try to punch like a few seals for themselves for their own pieces. Okay. Yeah. Okay. These are gonna be nice. And then for those who are done early, maybe we can start with the slight next step. So this is a biopsy punch. Um, it's rated single use, but we definitely use it more than once. And don't worry, we're not doing any biopsy samples from you guys. Um, this is for cutting the little seals that we were showing before um, out of a slab of PDMS. So this we already pre-cured before. It's like I said, it's like making jello literally. You just mix two things, you mix it, and then put it on a hot plate um, for about an hour, and you get something like this at the end of it, and you can feel it. It's like pretty soft, right? Mm -hmm. So for those who are already done, you might feel free to come up um, ahead. So then I'll give you this biopsy punch, and what I'll have you do is cut about two, two of these, um, just skewer it in, and then sometimes if it's stuck in here, that's okay. We'll have a tool to remove it. If it's stuck in here, that's okay. We can just peel it off. If you somehow rip this, totally fine. You can see that it's ripping here and there. That's so that's okay. Okay. So whoever's done, feel free to come up here. Um, we'll just do two holes each. Yeah. So we should. Uh, yeah. We only have twenty minutes left. Oh. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, if you feel, okay, maybe just one hole each then. I'll just let, have you go like this, and then boom, see, there's one right there. So if it doesn't come out, that's okay. We'll peel it out thereafter. Mm -hmm. just, yeah, so like that. And then if you're done, you can just put it here. So just maybe one hole each. If it, if it gets stuck in there, let us know. Um, I don't know how that long stick. If it's stuck, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So move things along. I'll just put a new one. I hope I don't have that long stick. But if we have a paper clip, it could yeah. help too. Um, on. Oh, it's stuck too. Okay, just just go the next one. It'll it'll like just go on, and we'll just take it out. It's okay. Yeah. And they can also just take from the stack yeah. already. 
see if they just get a feel of it. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks, guys. That's okay. Just get a feel. We have more than enough. And then once you're done, um, grab one of these plungers on your way back as well. And please note that there are the hole is not exactly in the middle. Okay, for these after you guys are done with those all. The so you can see there's a shorter and a longer side on either side of the holes, okay? You can see just slightly ever so different. There's a short side and the long side. You want to stick the seal from the longer side, okay? And the seal once so you guys can look at it too. Um, so these seals, if you can look at it, is not a cylinder. It's a, a little bit conical, you can see here. Try your best to stick bigger side, just like less intuitive, into the longer side of the, the ends from the holes. Okay, so you would push it in like this. Um, if you break it, that's totally okay. Happens all the time. We'll just get a new seal or a new plunger. Okay, so something like that, you see that? Once it's in there, that's pretty good. And I'll show you um, how the jig works after. So all your job is to get one of these seals, put the fat inside first into the longer side of the, the plunger. Sorry. Are you letting them use the jig? Yeah, I think they're just putting it in first, okay. and then once they got it in. Yeah, the fatter side. You have to like really like kind of bend it in. If you break it, that's okay. Just use a new seal. The reason is that it makes a better seal on that side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then there are some seals here too. So we'll, we'll like pick it out of the unit later if it's like stuck. Oh, you got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, grab one of those and grab. Do you have a plunger already? Did you? Oh, you want to try to punch one? <laughs> Oh, you have one. Okay, yeah. So put it from the longer side, the fat side in first. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. It might get stuck in there. Totally okay. Oh, maybe it's still here sometimes. See, like this one is still here. But essentially, that's kind of what you do. Um, oh, yeah, there's one thing. Yeah. And if it breaks, just just a new one. Yeah. Okay, so here's a plunger. So put it from the longer side and put the fat side in. Okay. What is it called again? PDMS. Okay. Yeah. On the yeah, on this side. And then make sure that the seal is the fat side that goes in first. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. You can like peel it out like with oh, an ice tray. Yeah. yeah, if it breaks, it's okay. <laughs> totally okay. Yeah, push it in until you get in. And then um where is the jig? Oh, the jig is here. And then so if you guys can come in here. Um, we'll show you how to do the the jig. Okay, so okay. Do you guys have it in? Okay. Oh, that's okay. Just get a new plunger. It happens sometimes to us too. There you go. So if you guys want to come here, see this plung uh, this little jig. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have time to use a jig for everybody. That's fine. Yeah, we have time. So what you do is you put your, so can I use yours as an example? So you guys can see it's a linear thing. This thing moves. There's a metal rod here. Um, well, you put you put your um, plunger in with the PDMS seal. You, if you're right-handed, then do on the right hand. If you're left-handed, you can do on the left hand. Just whatever side you're going to move, make sure the seal is right there. And make sure that the seal is pretty much like 90% in within the ends of the plunger. And then you just click it closed. So this is just a little... You know, if you need to open it, you push this and click it closed. And then you give it a little small push in the beginning until it kind of goes in. If a little ring of that PDMS breaks off, totally fine. That's exactly what it's supposed to do is because of the sheer stress of when we're pushing it in. You just push it all the way until it almost reaches the hole. And you'll see it over here like that. Okay, I'll give you another one so you can try it. Um, 
So something like this. That looks pretty good. Okay. So let me get you, let me prepare one for you. Is anyone using this? No. Okay. Um, here, do you want to try first? I'll go to her and then I'll, I'll give you. It's just a new one. Yeah, we'll clean it out later. So in this process, I guess you're already learning some of the frustrations associated with assembly or manual assembly. Hence why we want to automate some of this process. Okay. This is not perfect yet, but that's okay. Just for the demonstration. <clears throat> yeah. It is hard. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. Just let us know which ones and then we'll just clean it out. That's totally fine. Uh, oh, there are more here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. That's okay. As long as you can, you'll see that if it's a full seal, then it's nice. Like, yeah, just push it all the way in with your thumb or your finger. Is that the right time? 11.05, right? Right now? Yeah. Okay. Oh, 1108. Okay. 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 Fine. And then if you guys are done with your plungers, take a body that you already have. Um, and then I'll give you a blue cap. Oh, that's okay. We can we have a stick that we can push it back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's still the long. Oh, it Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. And then just use the jig now to push it in. Yeah. So just push it up to maybe like 3 mm before it reaches the hole. So if you're right handed, if your PDMS is on my right hand side, you push it until like this is where the hole is, like up to here. Okay. <clears throat> And then if you're done with that, I'll give you this. So once <clears throat> once you're done, let's say with your PDMS, so when you have the, P, let's say the PDMS is here, um, let's call that the bottom side. And let's call the blue side also the bottom side because, um, okay, because that's where the text is right side up, okay? So the where the right the text is right side up, you put the blue one on the bottom and you're gonna put the plunger in this way with the PDMS seal on the bottom of the holes. Okay, and then put in the last cap. So yeah, you can, yeah, so that happens. I'll let you guys figure that out too. So it is a bit frustrating when you push it too hard, the one inside the body that you worked so hard to put in earlier pops out. So then you have to kind of give it a little gentle twist when it goes in. So sometimes we actually do it without the caps first so that it has less friction and then do the caps individually because when the caps pop off, that's much easier to fix than the, the ones in the body, okay? So the side just goes on the top. So this will be on the bottom. So once, on yeah, once you push this, you're gonna push this using the jig all the way to here. Uh, okay, like to the bottom, and then you'll be in this orientation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Wherever that side that you put the PDMS in it is the bottom side. Yeah. And once you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're pretty much 70% there. Um, all you're missing, which you probably don't have to do today, is just a little rubber button on the bottom. Um, we typically cut it down, but for, for our tests in the lab, we don't need to cut it down so far right now. So you can just kind of have a feel and just um, kind of stick it in there. Um, we don't need the stick for our test so far. Yeah, but for the actual diagnostic test, we will have the stick because that's how you push it. Um, yeah, and then at the end, <laughs> if you're really still free right now and you feel like trying something new, um, you can try this. 
Oh, wait, am I? Is this correct, or would it be the other way? This is correct, though. But you have to put. Yeah, exactly. Push it all the way down. Yep, all the way down. Um, I'm trying to look for. Hey. Anyway, I thought I had a glass cutter with me, but I don't have a glass cutter. But that we use to cut these capillaries the size, oh, essentially. But I don't have it with me. I thought I prepared it. For... Oh yeah, so I'll give you a blue cap. Um, just here. So the blue cap goes on the bottom, so you see the text. Yeah, yeah. So this one will just remove, and that's why okay too. It's easier to put in. So this one on this side, you go on the bottom. Yeah, and then push it so that it's like somewhat equidistant. And then, yeah, exactly. And then you put this on the bottom, you put this on the top, and then it's pretty much there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're still waiting for that. Okay. Did I give you a blue cap? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, and then the only thing that was missing is just like the bottom, yeah, which we'll, we don't really need for our test right now. So thank you so much. <laughs> we'll use this for our test. Um, and then what I was telling some other people is there are these glass cutters that literally look like a pen. Mm -hmm. Do you see a glass cutter? I thought I brought one down, but maybe I didn't. I maybe I didn't. Okay, maybe it's a different box that I didn't bring. But essentially, you just like do little tiny, tiny scores, and then you break it in, uh, break it at the score line, and then you get, you know, a, a known length. So that. But we'll do that when we have our reagents, because we'll fill those up first, and then dry those. So there's so the some of the data that you'll see on Tuesday probably is some of the data you see with the um, liquid reagents. So those are the commercial liquid reagents. We are right now working on just like part of uh, Hope's PhD as well, as how to make these dried reagents, so lyophilizing the reagents so that they could fit, um, or not fit, they, they will all fit, but they can be shippable. So they won't, you know, we don't have to ship liquid. And you can see that the evaporation was an issue right, in some of the older units where it was just a tiny bit. So if you will to if, um, lyophilize them, then it's just, it's, yeah. it's remains dry. I can show you how to, yeah. how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank no, you so no, much. No, no, no. Yeah. I have to run to the Oh, no worries. No worries. Thing fell off when I was pushing. Yeah, you can see, right? Like some, yeah, exactly. Thank, Thank you, though. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. How is the assembly so far? Okay. It's Frustrating. Okay. It's like this or? Well, today is okay, but usually we try to client, like that's when we like, name. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of patience <laughs> in this project so, so far. Yeah. As long as it's not half the whole, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. But you can see that the same kind of construction as an ink no, in a ballpoint pen, mm -hmm. very similar. Yeah. yeah. So this was designed before we talked to Vic like this, and then we refined it when we were working with them. You would have to have it in a liquid buffer. So even like when you have your nasal, it has a little liquid. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we are, for this one, um, in our lab setting, we are still using some kind of similar lysis buffer, it just to break the, the viral cell, you know, the cell walls and whatnot yeah. um, to release the DNA. Yeah, um, in the future, we want to also lyophilize that too. So it would be already pre-dried in the unit. So all you have to do is spit and then it would already have the inactivation and the lysis buffer in it. Um, and then so you, all you have to do is literally what I said, just put it in hot water, boiling water. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Big Head helped us make about 10,000 of these, just like molding it, not assembling it. They helped us, they tried helping us actually assemble this part, 
but it was just very difficult to actually uh, tell them exactly how we want it. Like, you know, like these little nuances, they'll be like, what? You know, uh, and, you know, we were still in prototyping stage even till today. It's not like it's a product yet. Um, but that's why then they all they did was in the end put grommets in these and this. They actually had another tool to help put the grommets in the middle part. Um, and then they would ship those to us and we would do all these final assemblies. Essentially putting everything in the plunger is, was our job and then putting everything within the same unit. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah they, oh this is the older one i can tell because see we used to score before gluing it but there's another step that we're not even talking about today <laughs> we a lot of scoring gluing Sorry? no because they will move it will move and we will adjust it so you'll see on uh, tuesday when manu talks about it you push and pull this thing. So initially, you know, you have your unit like this, where, you know, you can pull it up, put your sample in, you close it. And then it's in the same configuration when you're heating it the first time. And then once the sample is loaded, you push it here. And then a little bit of the excess sample, let's say, ejects by the time it gets here, because this is a lower pressure than this one. And then you do the final push and then it would load it up into the capillary. Once you do that, then you have to actually push it all the way up to here. And so now your capillary with your sample and the reagents are in here, you kind of tap, tap, tap until they mat they they um, mix together. And then you stick it in the hot water like this. But now your reagents are exposed to the hot water as before it was in the kind of insulated area. Yeah. Thank you. The oh, box. Right? Uh, other way, other way. Yeah. It's a 50 50 like USB. Yeah. And <laughs> can now we have. Thank you so much for helping with the. And then I'll give you a blue cap. Do you have a blue cap ready? I have this. Okay, the blue cap goes on the bottom. So you can see there's a little bit of text here that tells you the orientation kind of like right side up. What, oh, what the, okay. Yeah. The blue is on the bottom and then the... You put it through the hole. You got it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, Oh. <laughs> All right. Do you have a blue cap yet? No. Okay. Oh. No. Make it back because we're using it, right? They're good. <laughs> we'll check though. Yeah, yeah, what for sure. Uh, so I'm putting it separate. Yeah, so the same way that you're putting the seal in, that's the bottom, let's say. Okay. And then you can see on the tube here, there's like little letters and it's still up. So that is the orientation. So that's okay. also right side up like that. Kind of the clip, you know. And then, um, so you put it like this. And then the blue bo the blue cap's on the bottom. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Or is this um, to, yeah. Or is it just to like show? Oh, oh. Yeah, we obviously with assembly and also we're going to be scaling up. Sure. And so it would be great to have more people who are interested. I know you're you're into the genetic biology, right? So more. Yeah, but I did a bubble project on like isothermal PCR. Oh, okay.
Oh, okay. Very oh. Making like an incubator for it. But, oh. Like, oh. But it was supposed to be a low cost incubator. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's like a copy yeah, firm. It just works. We like, we had like that yeah. before. Yeah. It just the project kind of stalled, but we had something like, exactly for Sam Egg. So it would do all the maneuvers, feeding, and all the push and pull. It was just difficult. We realized because the things that we do by hand, we have so many degrees of freedom that like what an actuator can do is actually yeah. very limited. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, we would. This yeah. Is super cool. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we are um right now we're just preparing <laughs> like last minute data for the paper that we're gonna this is just overdue paper that we should just um publish. But we're just trying to do one last round with um the dried reagents. Um and then if we can publish that, then it will be a nice story. And then we thank you. Bye bye.